Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm Tom Benzing. I uh, serve on the board of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, which is one of the sponsors for tonight's talk and our science talk series that we've been hosting here. And this is in our sixth year, so we're very happy that the Wayne Theater has um, helped us with that. I want to welcome you tonight. I want to welcome in particular any students that are in the room tonight. Um, it's always good to see uh, some of our Fishburne cadets in, in the room and uh, students from the local high school. I also want to recognize the Center for Cold Waters Restoration, another uh, sponsor, and the South River Watershed Coalition. The Virginia Museum of Natural History, um, some of you that have been attending these talks know that we're uh, hoping to open a campus here in Waynesboro. And um, the good news is that we're progressing on the design. Some of the images that you've been seeing here rolling on the screen are of our exhibit design as well as our building design. So this is what the building uh, currently looks like, the architect's rendering. Um, you saw the location there in the parking lot uh, at Constitution Park. And we've been doing some work to understand um, the foundational materials. Uh, some we were just talking before the uh, before the beginning of the talk here. We did some ground penetrating radar work to look at what's underneath there. There was an old mill site and a, and a raceway, which you can see. Um, there are no uh, burial mounds or anything like that that we need to worry about. So that's a good thing. The bad news is that um, the construction costs were not included in the governor's budget uh, this year uh, or in the budget from the, um, the houses, which there's still, it was crossover week last week, so they're still negotiating that, but we're not in those budgets. So we're gonna continue to progress with our detailed design planning and then hope that our construction costs will be funded in the coming year. Um, I will also share with you that on Friday this week, I'll be at the public library from four to 5 p.m. to hold an office hour for those that are interested in more details about our, prog our progression with the campus. Um, and I want to tonight recognize uh, one of my board, fellow board members uh, on the Center for Cold Waters Restoration. Hal is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Tom. Welcome to the did you say six years of cold yes. war? Well, going on the seventh year, building toward <laughs> 10 years of successful talks, science talks at the Wayne Theater. Welcome, one and all, and happy Valentine's Day. You don't get to say that often. Yeah. <laughs> same time, same breath. My name is Hal Oslista, and I'm a member, board member, as Tom is, of the Center for Cold Water, uh, Water's Restoration, and the member of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. These are the principal sponsors of, these, of this program tonight. I'm especially pleased tonight to, well, to introduce my very good friend and a fellow microbiologist, Dr. Howard Cater, who will be speaking with us this evening on the uh, watershed, the issue of the watershed from a microbiologist's point of view. Dr. Cater is a emeritus professor, having carried out uh, decades, 30 years, is it? 30, 35 years, 38 years, I won't forget the last three, <laughs> of research over in, in the, in the, uh, in the Williamsburg area um, at the uh, Insti Virginia Institute for Marine Sciences and also teaching at the, co at the, University, at the uh, College of William and Mary. Um, Howard received his bachelor's degree from Harper College and his PhD in the Biological Oceanography from the Florida State University. Uh, he and his wife Judith live nearby in Stanton, and it's my special pleasure, as I mentioned, to welcome Howard tonight. Everybody hear me? Okay. So, uh, when I was approached about giving a talk here, there was a lot of interest in watersheds. And uh, so what I've tried to do is focus my talk from a microbiologist's viewpoint on watersheds. Uh, and, uh, and also I wanted to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day when we get started. So let's see. Um, this works. 
So I, I developed this cartoon here, which essentially, and apparently pointers don't work on LCD screens, which essentially covers all of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, and that's a, a, a photograph of the Shenandoah River. And uh, you can see surrounding it all of the uh, watershed issues that are important. Okay, so you can, there are a million different definitions about watersheds. I basically think of it as a funnel. Uh, it's a geographic area through which water will funnel to some sort of receding water. It can be a stream, it can be a lake, it can be a river. Uh, and in this particular, Chris, give me this thing you broke off the car. Okay, so in this particular watershed, they, uh, this is from a, a British uh, publication. Uh, they show all the different kinds of activities, human activities that impact the watershed. And uh, I don't think we have nuclear discharge around here, but one thing I notice is that they do not have a sewage treatment plant, a wastewater treatment plant that's impacting uh, this particular watershed. What happens in a watershed affects the receding waters and groundwaters, and as everyone knows, a healthy watershed means healthy receding waters. If you have any questions, uh, don't feel free to bother me uh, to ask questions. So, from a microbiologist's perspective, and uh, I feel very uh, uh, happy about being able to talk from a microbiologist's perspective because given the last two years that we've had, nobody really wants to hear from microbiologists. <laughs> so uh, from, a, from a microorganism's pers perspective in, a, in an urban watershed, um, what would a microbe expect to see? And so these are some of the things, inorganic and organic com uh, compounds, uh, particles from erosion, atmospheric deposition. The atmosphere is a really significant source of nitrogen, which comes from car emissions. Uh, yard waste, household and lawn chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. My favorite, glyphosate, the worst chemical in the world. Uh, leachates from biosolids, leak chemicals from cars and trucks, compounds from tires. It turns out that tires now, there were recent research published that the tires abrade on the road and this material uh, is washed into receding waters in, in large amounts. And there are all kinds of chemicals in tires. Uh, and you probably also uh, are aware that when you have a wastewater treatment plant, all of the pharmaceuticals, personal care products, plastic particles, nutrients, microorganisms, everything goes into receiving waters. Uh, so these are some uh, gross pictures of, of, uh, of uh, sewer, <coughs> stormwater sewers, and the kinds of things that, that come out. Uh, what's important about um, non-point source runoff is that since we've developed so many areas, we have a lot of impermeable surfaces. The water does not penetrate into the ground. It runs off, especially in this area where we have this uh, high topography and low topography. We get very high velocities of water uh, that move all kinds of materials into receiving waters. The bottom line here with uh, non point source <coughs> runoff is that it's untreated waste. Okay, it's untreated. And although there, there are uh, rules that EPA has promulgated to try to treat some of this waste now. Thank you. <laughs> Chris told me the opposite. Okay, so from a microbiologist perspective, uh, in a watershed, in non-point source runoff, 
a negative thing is that you can have microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, and fungi that are carried into the receiving waters, and some of these are pathogenic. Okay. Uh, from a positive perspective, microorganisms that are in the receiving waters uh, can provide watershed services, that is, uh, detection of health risk, biodegradation of pollutants, recycling of nutrients, and breakdown of natural organic compounds. So that's a, that's a positive. If I can figure this out. The most common non-point source pollution problem in the United States are exceedances of coliform bacteria, fecal coliform bacteria. Uh, we have uh, standards for freshwater recreational use. We have standards for um, shellfish growing areas. And these exceedances generally occur following precipitation events. And so it's not just me saying this, it's the EPA, the top 10 causes of impairment in the U.S. are here, and pathogens heads the list. So you might wonder why that is. Uh, and I'll talk about that. But this is <clears throat> some data from the Friends of the Middle River. And essentially what it shows here is that when you have all these highlighted areas, when you have precipitation, here, you get elevated counts of, uh, in this case, it's E. coli, which is a fecal coliform. So you don't have to take my word for it that precipitation increases these counts in receiving waters. So where do the fecal coliforms and the potential pathogens come from? Okay, well, a biggie, a very biggie, is livestock. And I've, I've made a couple of uh, calculations here. Uh, and these numbers are really incredible. A thousand cattle will produce 175 tons of wet manure each week. Dairy cow production is 60 pounds of manure a day. And if you use E. coli count, which is a fecal coliform, uh, that's found, that people have reported in uh, manure, you wind up with a concentration of, a pro of 10 to the 10th E. coli cells uh, in that manure. And to reach the recreational standard, which happens to be 126 E. coli uh, per 100 mil, means that you have to basically dilute the water from one cow by a, a volume of water equivalent to a 20 by 40 swimming pool that's four feet deep. So this is a really important observation. And I know that in, in talking with people like uh, Bobby Weitzkaver, that uh, it's really important to understand these numbers Question, Howard, may I? Sure. Yeah. Those are huge numbers. What are the numbers, however, that uh, uh, decline? If, if uh, 10 to the 10 E. coli cells leave the animal, get in the soil, go into the creek, they don't multiply there. They probably don't maintain themselves there. No, they, they don't. They fall off. But do you know what percentage does they decline? How does that work? Well, it, it depends. <laughs> It depends on temperature, time of year, uh, how fast the flow rate is. Uh, the main thing is, as, as Bobby has said numerous times, is you need to keep the animals out of the water because a direct defecation into the water is the worst thing. Now, people have talked about um, uh, using buffer zones and keeping the cattle away from the water and treeing and doing whatever you can do to stop the bacteria from being transported to the to the receiving waters is important. But yes, they do die off. Uh, it depends on 
the summertime versus the wintertime. This long, longer survival in the wintertime. And I, I just wanted to show you what, uh, I'll talk about the standard, it's 126 E. coli cells uh, per 100 mils. And I just wanted to kind of show you the volume of water that 126 cells is in. And these cells are like one micron, let's say, one micron diameter. So it's three and a half ounces with uh, 126 cells. So it's a very small number of cells. So this, this standard is very conservative and very protective of public health. Uh, yes, this, I was trying to remember the name of this. The Environmental Integrity Project has a really interesting report on uh, livestock produced in the Shenandoah Valley. And these numbers are huge. Uh, 410,000 tons of poultry litter, 1 billion gallons of liquid manure. It has to go somewhere. Uh, sometimes it gets lagooned. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with what happened in North Carolina uh, a couple of years ago when they had very uh, high storm events and the lagoons broke and the, uh, this was a big waste lagoon and it went into the News River. Uh, so it's a really astounding number uh, of, of material that's produced. Pets, everybody loves their pets. But pets uh, obviously produce waste and uh, on impervious surfaces, they get washed into receiving waters. Uh, in Kansas, they did a USGS study in Kansas City and suggested that 25% of the indicator bacteria that were in the receiving waters came from pets. And of course, pet waste contains a variety of pathogens, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, can lead to human health risk. So if you start to look at these literature values, <clears throat> it's pretty astounding. Uh, 73 million dogs in the United States and, and you do any of these <coughs> excuse me, calculations, an average dog produces 275 pounds of feces per year, equal to 10 million pounds per year. And based on surveys that people have done, only 40%, uh, only 60% of the owners actually pick up pet waste. Uh, I know that living in Stanton, there's a very high proportion of people that actually pick up the pet waste and they have these little plastic bags that you can Every once in a while, you see one. And uh, the Seine River must be terrible, because when I was in Paris, they love their dogs, and they never pick up any waste. It's all over the place. Have lunch with them. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, so that's equal to 4 million pounds of untreated waste per year. Uh, and I don't know about cats. I couldn't find anything really uh, in the literature about cats. So the diseases carried by pet waste are uh, standard, the standard diseases that, that you read about, Campylobacter, Salmonella. Uh, there are parasites, toxocariosis, cariasis, toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a, uh, a, a parasite in cats. And based on uh, epidemiological data, the CDC thinks that 30% or more of us uh, carry this parasite unknowing. It doesn't really cause a problem. It causes a problem in pregnant women, uh, but there are, it, it's just an amazing uh, thing when you think about this. Wild animals, uh, people like to blame wild animals on a lot of, uh, a lot of water contamination issues, but I don't think it's really significant, uh, except when you have like 10,000 uh, Canadian geese that sit on a little pond. Uh, for the most part, the overwhelming contributions come from livestock and pets. So some new microbiology that I'd like to talk about uh, in regard to the standard. Now, EPA, and I've worked with some of these people, have been
trying to develop much better standards to protect public health in recreational waters, shellfish growing waters. And what's happened is that they, the old fecal cold form uh, indicator, which some of you may have heard, is no longer in use. Uh, what's no, what they use now uh, is either directly go for Escherichia coli or the Enterococcus group. And Escherichia coli is in all warm-blooded animals. And they have updated the numerical standard, which I previously mentioned, 126 per 100 ml, uh, which is now based on actual health risk studies that were conducted at a variety of locations in the United States. So people that went swimming were interviewed afterwards, and if they had uh, gastrointestinal um, upsets or any sort of diseases other than that, um, they were uh, interviewed and, and the data were, were developed to actually determine health risk. And this is the, uh, this is, uh, you don't have to remember all these numbers, but this is the, uh, the new standard. And you see up here, if you can read it, <coughs> the estimated delta rate, if you follow these numbers, is 36 per thousand people. And that 36 includes what would be a background level of people getting having symptoms without actually going into water. So the number is uh, 126 per 100 ml, and it has uh, a higher upper value that, that can't be exceeded, and uh, it's, it's a pretty good standard now. In case you're wondering how this is done, when uh, you, people talk about how they measure E. coli. Uh, it's done on membrane filters, which interesting, interestingly enough are cellulose acetate, which I'll talk about later. Uh, they're very thin filters and they have uh, known pore sizes. So things that uh, they can recover, things as small as bacteria. Uh, and the diagram here basically is that you put a water sample in a funnel uh, you put the filter in between the funnel and the, uh, uh, the retention bo uh, bottle. You pull a vacuum on it, you suck the water through, and then you take the membrane and you put it on uh, a petri dish that contains a medium on which the cells can grow and chemicals that will determine whether or not you have E. coli. So, this is a, a typical type of example. Uh, I don't think you can see that there are <clears throat> other colonies here of bacteria that actually grew, but they're not purple. So they didn't, so they weren't E. coli because there's a chem biochemical reaction that occurs with E. coli. So that's how this is actually done when people report uh, E. coli values. So as I said, E. coli bacterial standards are based on what we call cultural methods. You grow the cells on this medium, the ones that turn purple are positive. And what's a problem with this method and why we're going to talk about a new method is that it doesn't tell you what the source of the bacteria are. Okay. It can come from any warm-blooded organism. So, some of our, some of us have become, or I used to be one, uh, a watershed detective, and using new molecular methods to try to determine where the fecal coliforms, the E. coli, came from. Did it come from an animal? Did it come from a human? <clears throat> And this is now called bacterial or microbial source tracking. And essentially what it does is that it assumes that you have specific targets on the DNA or the RNA of 
an organism, a microbe, that lives only in either humans or animals. And if you can detect these differences, then you can try to determine where the contamination is coming from, what the source is. And these are uh, just some examples of what's being developed now. EPA has a method to detect human fecal pollution. Uh, and this group here reported on a method to detect, specifically detect dog fecal pollution using a, 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 an organism called bacteroides. So hopefully these techniques, they're somewhat research oriented, but they will become more common and then they will enable people to try to identify sources of contamination. Uh, Okay, so the second part of my microbiology talk here has to do with plastics. And why are plastic, <coughs> excuse me, why do we care about plastics from a microbial perspective? And I, I think I'll, I'll hold that until I go further in this talk. So, I'm sure all of you have seen these pictures when we talk about plastics, about uh, sea animals, uh, turtles eating plastic bags uh, and dying, whales. There was a whale that had 78 pounds of plastic in its stomach and it died. Uh, and of course, there's the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is the most uh, astoundingly ugly thing in uh, these gyres in the ocean of circulating water. Uh, and actually, as terrible as that looks, that's only like less than 1% of the plastic that's been produced. And some of the stuff uh, is, has dates on it, like 1960. It's been out there that long. Uh, <clears throat> So that's the Pacific Ocean, or an ocean environment. I took this picture behind the Aldi's and, and Stanton. <laughs> um, and there's, there's like a fence there, and the, the Amtrak runs back there. Uh, there's plastic everywhere. And one of the new plastics that shows up, masks made of plastic. plastic and you see those everywhere sometimes. So we're not very far from uh, plastics. Okay, this is a little bit of a complicated uh, slide here, and I'll try to talk about this. Uh, new observations as early as 2017, uh, made by some oceanographic people, showed that uh, you know, these large pieces of plastic that you see floating around are not, not alone. There are other pieces of plastic that are much smaller and some that are very, very small. And you can find this material in the ocean. Why are we concerned about that? Because from a microbial perspective, when things get very small, and they're on the order of magnitude of bacteria, the bacteria can interact with them. Bacteria like to, some bacteria like to stick on surfaces. So these particles can have bacteria growing on them. Uh, there are uh, some research that shows that these small particles, when things get very small, they become very active chemically, perhaps, so that they can adsorb organic compounds, toxic compounds, heavy metals, and be transported into organisms, or they can uh, aggregate into larger particles that organisms can eat. So these are concerns about these new things that we now call nanoplastics. And they have not been well studied at all. So I put this 
size chart up here that I got from somebody or other. Uh, and I think the EU has, uh, has advanced some of this uh, understanding in that they've actually developed uh, classifications for the plastics. So the microplastics are things that are smaller than five millimeters. And the nanoplastics are basically smaller than one micron. So, and the nanoplastics can range all the way down to 10 to the minus ninth meters. Here, back, so on the bottom here are, are uh, comparative sizes. So here's a golf ball, here's a human hair, it's in the microplastic range. It's okay if I touch this. Yeah. Bacteria, one micron, viruses, and molecules down to one nanometer. This is a picture, uh, a scanning electron microscope of uh, net microplastics, and in this case they're nanoplastics that are, you can't really see all of them. Some of them are colonized uh, by bacteria, and that's unfortunately out of focus, but these are bacteria, and you, there are some here you can see. Uh, so it's not just flute music, it's actually happening. <coughs> Okay, where do the particles come from? I already talked about car tires. Uh, if you have any garments <coughs> that are made out of synthetics, every time you wash those, they release nanofibers, very small fibers. Uh, a fellow researcher took hot water and put it into baby bottles and found that there was a release of nanoplastics into the water. Uh, so the, the, the idea is that we know that plastics break down. We don't really understand macroplastics break down. We don't really understand the mechanisms of how they get to these really small sizes, but they do. And people have been trying to understand this, but uh, it's, it's a very difficult problem because of the analytical methods involved in trying to detect these little particles in the real world where you have particles of everything else around. And wherever you look, uh, they're in the air, they're carried by the wind, they're in the water, they're in drinking water, they're in soil, they're in deep sea sediments. They found them in the Mariana Trench. Uh, and they're in organisms. And they're in Antarctica. They're in Arctic, they're everywhere. Wastewater treatment plants. Okay. I think uh, that in the United States they were trying to put some controls on the, on the use of micro and nano plastic particles in personal care products like toothpaste or uh, facial scrubs. But whenever you use that, it goes down the drain, it goes to the wastewater treatment plant. The wastewater treatment plants uh, were not designed to stop tiny particles on the order of microns. Uh, there is a significant amount that goes into the sludge, but, oh, okay. <laughs> significant amount that goes into the sludge, but uh, there, because wastewater treatment plants have to treat large volumes, a lot of it goes into the river or where it discharges into the ocean or the river. Uh, and the sludge that's left over, uh, which euphemistically is called biosolids, is full of this stuff as well. 
and then it's applied to crop lands, and there have been studies that show that the particles are taken up by plants as well. This is a really interesting little, little tidbit. Uh, some of these tea companies now are making tea bags out of plastic. So someone took these tea bags and uh, took the tea out, steeped them in hot water, I think it's 95 degrees, and found that they released both micro and nanoplastics. So we've been eating these things uh, for a long time now. This is one of my, so I'm in the rotary in Stanton, and uh, one of the things that we do is we clean up uh, Greenville Avenue in a, a certain location uh, near the car dealerships, and the most abundant thing that any of us see are cigarette butts on the ground. The most common form of plastic pollution which you may or may not have known, are cigarette butts. The material in the filter is cellulose acetate. And that's the same stuff that film is made out of, or used to be made out of. I don't know if anybody uses film anymore. Uh, these numbers are just staggering. Uh, the Chinese produce over a trillion cigarettes a year now. The United States and the UK are, are down because people have gotten smart and stopped smoking. Uh, we don't know how long it takes for this material to degrade. We know that it contains uh, toxins, heavy metals. Uh, they put all kinds of things in cigarette tobacco that come through combustion products, carcinogenic combustion products. Uh, and you've probably seen pictures of seabirds that eat eat these uh, cigarette butts when they're floating in the water. Uh, they're toxic to fish. There have been lots of experiments where you take cigarette butts and put them in water with fish, and the fish, uh, some of them die. So I don't know what to do about cigarette butts, but they're an issue. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but all it kind of uh, uh, condenses what I've been saying here. And of course, the bottom line is, is this right here, health and ecological effects. We really have, except in uh, laboratory studies that have been done with artificial plastics, have no idea about what these health effects might be to humans or in the environment, in the real world at this point. So, uh, we've been, as I said before, we've been eating and breathing these particles for numerous years. Uh, they've been found in, in, in our lungs, in our blood, uh, in other organs, liver, kidney, uh, and nobody really knows what's going on. So this is a study that uh, was just uh, done at Vims, and the idea was to take rainbow trout and to challenge them with different kinds of particles, and then after that challenge to add uh, a virus that shows up in aquaculture situations, um, intense aquaculture situations with large numbers of fish, the, uh, and to see what happens. And so, and these bars represent the numbers of mortalities that occur. So if you just uh, challenge the fish with virus, get this bar, if you just challenge the fish with 
microparticles naturally occurring. They use spartina, pieces of spartina. You get this size bar. If you challenge them with polystyrene and viruses, you get this bar. If you challenge them with nylon microfibers, <clears throat> you get almost 80% uh, mortality. The way they uh, explain this is that the nylon microfibers actually uh, open portals in the gills or in the gut to allow the virus to get in. So this is an experiment that actually looks at uh, interacting uh, actions of stressors. It's not just a straight study that would look at only the effects of virus or only the effects of particles. But those are microparticles. How big are those? Oh, excuse me? Those are not nanoparticles. Those are microparticles. No, they were nanoparticles. They were nanoparticles. Yes. Uh, they were. And, uh, so, again, going back to me as a microbiologist, <laughs> Uh, the big question is whether or not bacteria, specifically bacteria, because that's, they generally are involved in this sort of thing, can biodegrade plastics. And there are some, uh, some information that suggests, yes, they can uh, in laboratory situations. Uh, they they have uh, identified enzymes that can break down polyethylene uh, or scort. But since there is so much of this material in the ocean now, uh, as a microbiologist, I would suggest that this isn't really occurring at an appreciable rate. And this material is going to be there for a long time. So, now that I've talked about all of these different interacting factors, uh, in a watershed, you probably can understand now every one of these little cartoony things. Uh, the ones on the very uh, left on the bottom, those, that's an SEM picture of the microbeads that are putting uh, abrading, abrasion products toothpaste or facial scrubs or whatever. Okay, so uh, it, as I was going to say, microbiologists are infrequently invited to talk because we usually have problems <laughs> that we have to talk about. So um, I hope I didn't spoil your Valentine's Day. <laughs> but anyway. Well, thanks, Howard, and please join me in thanking him for the. We're happy to take a few questions if you have them. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Where's the good news in all of this? Yeah, where's the good news? <laughs> well, you know, plastics have been very useful, uh, but. No one really foresaw that this was going to happen. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know where the good news is. Uh, hopefully, uh, somebody will find out that that the detrimental effects of these plastics, these nanoplastics, uh, can be overcome by the biology of organisms, or that they really don't cause problems. Uh, People have demonstrated that they cause problems, but they, but that's been not done with the naturally occurring nano or microplastics. They use bi engineered stuff that you can buy, you know, that that's nice and uniform. Yeah, I noticed your last chart that had the rainbow tr uh, trout chart, where it was just the nanoplastics. Were there no deaths from that? From them? I think it was a, uh, only in the interaction with the virus. Uh, Just for those that are was, online, we're referring to the graphic that yeah, shows I think the it was different trees. It was much lower. I mean, it was a, it could have been a baseline. 
Okay. Uh, I, I couldn't see yeah. it hard from here. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to try to go back to that slide? Yeah. Uh, it's just a couple back. I think. That's right okay. there. Yeah. So microparticles so, only. Microparticles didn't cause any problem. Base. It's a baseline. But viruses, virus, this is the uh, uh, hemopoietic virus uh, that uh, shows up under intensive agriculture conditions with some on it, and it, uh, it, it really is a bad virus. So, yeah, so the virus alone is about 20%, somewhere 20% mortality, whereas with the microfibers, you're up at 80%. <coughs> It doesn't happen with with the polystyrene, which is really their little round blobby things. They don't uh, abrade the uh, the lump, the uh, gill or the uh, gut tissue. But these things are long fibers. That but still, that rate is way higher with the polystyrene than. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is, but it's not as bad as the nylon. <clears throat> Another question in the back? Yeah, I've got with your uh, fecal coliform, not, not the fecal coliform, but the uh, E. coli. You were saying you could, can now have methods to detect where they come from. Can you quantitate that? I mean, can you say in a watershed, I mean, there's many things in a watershed. Yes. Can you put percentages on that? Well, where that stuff is coming from? The yeah, question is about mean, source tracking, right? Yeah, the source yeah. tracking. I didn't go into to uh, the PCR method, the yeah. polymerase chain reaction, but you can quantify the signal, uh -huh. so you can tell how many were there. Right. <clears throat> so, and, and, and it's especially important when you have uh, areas with septic systems right. and with uh, what they call cap capos. Uh, concentrated animal farming. Right. Yeah. PCR is also what they use for pharmaceuticals and all the other things that they're looking at. No, PCR is is just really uh, good for yeah. detecting a specific piece of DNA. Yeah. At a at a very low level. Uh, yes, in the front here. Um. So I scoop a lot of dog waste in my backyard and putting it into a plastic bag and taking it to the landfill has always been kind of an issue for me. So just last week I ordered a small composter that mm -hmm. I'm going to use specifically just for the dog waste. Mm -hmm. So I was going to put maybe a little hay in there and, yeah. and the dog yeah. waste. Will the composting kill all the pathogens that are in dog waste? Most of them, I think. Okay. Um, some of the uh, the protozoans form spores that are pretty resistant, but certainly the elevated temperature that you get with composting should uh, kill bacteria. Yes, in the back. So I grew up swimming in lakes like in Illinois and never knew that that could be a problem. But these girls were born in Florida and you hear all the time the bacteria in the water because it's always hot. So I'm a little leery about swimming in water, you know, ever since living in Florida for so long. And we went on vacation to Smith Mountain Lake first week of September. And I made sure to look online at the water report mm -hmm. <laughs> to make sure they were testing it. But my question is though, that lake is huge. It's like 500 miles of, of, of shore, of shoreline. And our families had, you know, boats parked there, and I saw gasoline floating. I'm, this is like right up my alley because I'm always thinking about the things that are brought inside the house. And the girls jumped in with their grandpa and um, aunt and uncles. I'm like, oh well, you know. Um, and everybody was okay, but how do you trust those reports that people like you are going out and testing parts of the water? And then is it safe really to be swimming near? Where you see gas floating, you know, <laughs> because it's, that's that's where everybody goes to vacation. Well, I was super reluctant. To and she was very reluctant. I didn't want to put my head on. Yeah. 
So the question was about, oh, What's sorry, the we're reading this for the, the online audience a little bit. Yeah, the question the, was about swimming hazards and how yeah. do we know whether or not the testing is right, being done in right. a way that actually determines our risk where we are as opposed to somewhere else on a big lake. Exactly, because I looked at the Smith Mountain report that day and it said bacterial levels were in the green. It was clear, you know. Well, it's a, it's a big task, <laughs> especially when you have a large body of water, uh, the issues of uh, coverage right. and frequency of sampling. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not really familiar with Smith, Smith Mountain Lake. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's got septic systems or if it's on, if it has septic systems, that, that could be an issue. Okay. Uh, I know from my experiences with, <laughs> uh, in Virginia Beach, that they sample the beach every day, every single day at various locations. And it costs money. And I understand from this, that report that I that I mentioned that um, in this in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, it's very uh, infrequent to actually see signs that say whether the water quality in a particular reach is okay or not to use. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what we really need are better methods to measure water quality something that would sit in the water, and I actually worked on some of this before I retired, something that would sit in the water and sample over time and integrate a sample so that you would have better information than just a single grab sample. But that, that's where it is now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and I'll share, and Howard can maybe confirm or deny this, but with rivers, one thing to think about is whether or not you've had a recent rain event. You cited some of the data that the Friends of the Middle River shared and right. runoff and stormwater runoff from farm fields as a non-point source can raise the bacteria levels. And if you're uh, you know, going into the river shortly after a storm, you're probably getting exposed to higher levels. Whereas if you let that stormwater pass and it's lower and clearer, you're probably less likely to be exposed to yeah. that kind of a pathogen. Sounds good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe one more question from Hal. And then... Well, I'd like to turn it the other way around and ask our, our, our group a question. How many of you all are going to carry your reusable shopping bag if you go to Kroger's, Food Lion, wherever next time? Get rid of those flimsy blue bags that we all have too many of. Get rid of them all. And in some, and, and some states, areas, they are with, uh, making them illegal. Yeah. And they think they ought to make them illegal. Charlottesville's now charging five cents for a plastic bag when you go to the stores to try to deter people, deter people from from doing that. Uh, the, the the weight of plastics is just incredible. It's just uh, uh, millions and millions of tons have been produced. Is it true? I think I read somewhere where that gyro and Pacific is equivalent to the state of Texas. Uh, the size of the garbage patch? Yeah. yeah. It's huge, but I don't know if it's the size of Texas or not. I mean, there are, there are numerous gyres of this stuff. Yeah. And, and that's only, the, there are problems with trying to understand where all the plastics are, because the gyres only represent something like 1% of the plastics that have been produced. What we need to do is have somebody invent a device that goes out and harvests that plastic and recycles it somehow. Yeah. So those young folks that are in the audience, think about inventing a, a way to get us out of this plastics problem. One last question, and then we're gonna we're gonna close it for tonight. Well, it's not so much a question, although it is questionable. I belong to the Waynesboro Women's Club, and for years now we've been collecting plastic bags. Uh, taking them to one lady's house where she and her husband keep them until we get 500 pounds of plastic bags. It takes a year, at least. And there are about 40 people turning in these bags. People bring them to me even though they're not in the club. They bring me plastic that they've collected. Okay. We make, uh, we turn them over to a company that makes uh, benches. But I still don't like it. I don't want to have to do it, period. I want those plastic bags to go away. I don't even need
need a fence like that. <laughs> I'd rather sit on the dirt. So there. Yeah. All right, thank you and thank you everyone for coming and I'm sure that Howard be willing to stick around and ask questions. Ideas for science talk topics and if you have any of those, please share those with myself or uh, Jenna who's in the audience or Hal, those of us that serve on the Center for Cold Water Restoration Board. So many of our topics this semester or this, this year have come from audience suggestions, so we certainly appreciate those.